Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for the delay. Uh, appreciate you bearing with us. I'm uh, Nicola Gretton, Flexible Learning Manager at NTU and Code Fellow. I'm joined by my fellow Code Fellows, uh, Leah Haveman and Leonard, who, who is uh, driving everything forward for us. <laughs> Beautifully. Are we are we good? We've got yeah, yeah, we're okay, good. Okay, so I'll continue. Um, so as you may or may not be aware, um Leo and I uh co-convene the code special interest group on learning design. And earlier in the year, we were working with Neil, who's there on the panel, uh Leonard, and we thought it'd be really nice for one of the outputs to be a webinar series that places learning designers at the heart of that series of conversations. Because quite often we talk about the practice, we don't necessarily always talk about the people, what it means to be a learning designer, the career development journey that we go on. So we've had two webinars already. So starting out with people at the start of being a learning designer, what that looks like, to all the way up to where we are today. That's the third in the series, which is you're a learning designer, now what? So, um, I have to give absolute full praise and credit to Leonard. This He has driven this. He's been pulling together some fantastic panellists and sharing some really interesting debates that I know from people in the community, my own team of learning designers have said to me, it's really great. We're really enjoying part of this discussion and part of, being this, uh, part of this community. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Leonard and today is exceptional panel. Okay, um, so I'll try to make this really quick. Uh, so, okay. Uh, many educationalists, many people uh, have expressed interest in becoming learning designers. So you're a barista, you're a hairdresser, you're an academic, you're a learning technologist, and then you want to become a learning designer and somehow it happens. You were looking for a job and then you found a job. Um, so now what? Um, what is it like? What are the struggles and, and victories of being a learning designer? The last panel we had, I think was amazing, but it was a bit on the encouraging side. And um, and so, you know, this is looking at like the, the kind of the grittier side of like, how do you get on at, as a learning designer? We have, uh, we're very fortunate to have a really stellar panel uh, with us. Um, Neil Mosley, a, a code fellow whom uh, many of you know, consultant and author. Um, Tom McDowell, also learning designer and head of the, the learning group, uh, the, or the learning network, excuse me, uh, a group that really is a group of what I would consider learning designers. It's a group of learning designers for learning designers. Um, uh, Ajmal Sultani, the uh, chief learning designer at uh, the University of Cambridge's executive education uh, department, and Luke Hobson, who is the uh, senior instructional designer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We also may have uh, Rhiannon Pollard coming, who is a uh, I think a, a assistant uh, director at the University of Florida has actually done research into the, the ups and downs of the lives of instructional designers in higher education. Um, so without any further ado, um, I, I'd like to ask our first question, which is why is, uh, why is learning design um, hard? And uh, I, I, I will start with uh, Ajmal if, if we, if we if I may. Thank you, Leonard. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Right, Thank, thanks for having me and great to be here with this panel. I appreciate the invitation. Also wanna say thank you to the uh, event team. Uh, I was dropping in and out of the event uh, today and the organization has been great. I appreciate it as well. Uh, I've been, uh, just to add a, a bit uh, about myself in case uh, you don't know, um, I've been working in learning design for uh, about 12 to 13 years. And I've, I've been in all the different roles you can think of uh, when it comes to this area, including the LT role, the ID role, the learning design role. 
playing strategic roles, um, but also doing the hands-on stuff as well. So I hope uh, my, my answer helps. To add to that, I'm a very positive guy. So this question, I'm going to flip this question around a bit. And that is that what do you need to do or be as a learning designer in order to face all hardships and challenges? And I would say there's two things. One is psychology, and the second one is technology. And by psychology, and I'll keep it short, and there's a lot to say, and I'm sure a lot of our panelists will know this as well. By psychology, I mean the psychology of learning. Sometimes we confuse learning design with um, copy editing, copywriting, and maybe even UX and designing. But actually learning design is all about learning and how humans learn, how adults learn. So <clears throat> to face any challenges, you would need to really appreciate the human capabilities and what our brains can do from a neurological perspective, but also a cognitive perspective and then a bit of a social psychology perspective as well. So really get strong on the psychology side of things. And I think that goes a long way to support you in meeting any challenges. And then the second part, we can't get away from the technology. And by technology, uh, I mean anything that's been present for humans uh, for, uh, for the centuries so we can learn. That starts with a you know, pen and paper all the way to chalk books. And now we enter the era of AI. So really um, appreciate the technologies and tools available to you. Um, learn about them, use them yourself in your day to day. And I, I get, again, you'll be able to face uh, any challenge that comes your way. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, I'll, if I could pass it to, to Luke, um, who many of many of uh, the audience know already from his YouTube channel, among other things. Um, why is learning design hard? What's, what's hard about learning design? Try to convince us not to do it. Just, no. No problem. If that's, if that's what you want me to do, Leonard, I got you. Don't worry about it. So the thing is within the design world is that there's a lot of people out there who have no idea about who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah. Thumbs up. So that is definitely the hardest part is actually working with other people to be able to say, this is the value of design. Talking about it from being able to actually sell that to others to say, this is why I'm on the project. This is why I'm on the team. And this is actually how I can help out. If I had a time machine and I go back in time and give myself a piece of advice, by far, it would be to focus on people skills communication, empathy, trying to be able to work with others, see things from their perspective. Because oftentimes when we think about design, we think about the learning sciences, the andragogy, we think about tech, research, project management. And then this little last thing that actually becomes a majority of your job is relationship management. It's working with subject matter experts, stakeholders, deans, professors, instructors, many other different types of people. And by far, that is one of the hardest lessons is that you know something in your heart of hearts that you should be doing something, but then you have to actually go and convince someone to get buy-in, form a team around you to be able to influence a part of a design. And sometimes that's really frustrating. Frustrating. And then other times, though, you can meet in the middle and you can actually see things from a different perspective and it becomes an amazing type of product, whatever you are making of a training, a course, a program, a workshop or whatever it actually is. But by far, that is something that I wish I had known before coming into this field is how much I am working with other people and trying to be able to coach, to give feedback and go through all these different types of motions to really get everyone on the same page before going through with the entire design process. Does that work, Leonard? Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure can. Uh, is, it, is it something you've worked on? Of course. Of course, absolutely. No, for, for sure. It, it took me falling on my face about 10 times in a row with meeting with different subject matter experts to finally realize, hey, before I start with doing all of this, I need to take a step back. I need to know more about the people who I am actually working with. Why are they on the project? What is important to them? How can I speak their language and understand more about their terminology and their perspective? Because then as we go forwards with the actual design, I can think about all of those things and I get to learn more about how they receive feedback. What do they like to actually do as far as for being able to schedule things? Are they most creative in the morning or in the evening? How can I work around all these different forms of parameters? So you're going to learn about this 
this. And you're definitely going to learn from experience the first time that you go into these different forms of projects. But absolutely, you can still work on being able to think more about it from a communication standpoint, from an empathy standpoint, a flexibility standpoint as you're working along your way. Nice one. Um, next, uh, the inestimable Tom McDowell. Um, uh, why is being a why is it hard being learning designer? What's hard about it? Well, I'm, I'm here to I'm here to balance out that first one because I, I I'm. I, the opposite. I'm not known for positivity. I bring the other end of the spectrum to every conversation I'm ever in. Um, the biggest thing, I think the biggest adjustment I certainly had to go through, and I've sort of spoken to other people about it, is acknowledging that you are forever the servant in the relationship. Um, you are going into a career and a position where you don't get to make business decisions. You get to make business decisions work. Um, you, we often talk about wanting a seat at the table. And I think sometimes we conflate that with if we get a seat at the table, we can stop businesses making these huge mistakes in our minds. Um, but we forget that learning is not the focus of any business. Now, every business will say learning is a massive focus for us, but businesses exist for one reason, and that's to make money. L&D exists within the business for one reason, and that's to help the business succeed at whatever it's trying to do which is usually make money. Um, so we are forever in a servant role. Our job is not to tell the business what direction to go in. It's to say, hey, that's a cool direction or not, in which case you may need to consider moving. Um, and how can I help go there? Um, that can be quite a difficult thing to get your head around, especially if you have to get to grips with the idea that you will not always like that direction, but your job remains helping everyone in the business achieve that direction. Um, okay, can I just follow up with that question? Because mm -hmm. for those that don't know Tom McDowell, um, uh, superstar chair of uh, the learning group, Tom is a L&D practitioner, so he's not in higher ed. And I would have expected you, of all people, to, to give us a rosier, more empowering picture where, you know, like L&D, because, you know, isn't, I mean, isn't L&D meant to be the people who... You know, I, I sort of think of them as starting at an earlier place, asking more difficult questions. They're the ones that are asking, like, is this a real problem? Is this a learning problem? Is this, you know, like, is this, are we really kind of going about it the right way? But you're kind of saying, look, as an as a L&D practitioner, as a L uh, learning designer, you are ultimately just going to have to accept, to some extent, the brief that you're given. Absolutely. And I always say, like, and I'll put my hands up to this. We're very good at saying, oh, yeah, you get in at the ground floor, you ascertain the real problem, you always do a highly detailed needs analysis. But unfortunately, sometimes the CEO emails your manager and says, hi, we need some learning about this and we need it next week. And your team goes, I guess we're doing that then. Um, because sometimes you're not able to say, no, we're going to do it the right way. Um, the important thing and probably the most difficult thing is to never give up on doing it the right way. No matter, cause no matter how many times you get that, just do it. There will always be those golden moments where you can say to the business, hang on, we've got some time here. And that's why I always like Guy Wallace um, really pushed back on this whole refuse to be an order taker thing, um, because actually it's great to at times be an order taker because that builds credibility. It builds a relationship. Do take orders, but offer little improvements rather than trying to say, no, we can't possibly do that. We have to spend six months doing a deep analysis, say, hey, look, that's great. We can definitely do that. Could I have three days just to do a little bit of a dig in? That's far more realistic than pretending we're going to action map every intervention we ever um, implement. Um, there will be times when there's time for that, but there will be times when even the best of us just have to go, OK, this isn't the best possible solution, but it's the viable solution. And it's better than giving our people nothing. It's a big sort of ego surrendering moment to say, I'm not the important thing here. My... I don't know, um, attachment to a certain way of working isn't important. What's important is that the people I'm here to help get something to help them adjust to this change. Amazing. Um, last, but certainly not least, our, our beloved Neil Mosley, um, code fellow uh, and consultant and author. Um, 
why is learning design hard? Why, what, what will we tell people to, to, to put people off, uh, you know, our potential jobs and get, them, <laughs> get, get the competition out of here? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I, I, I've kind of got two answers, a glib answer and then a serious answer. My glib answer is a, a kind of why is learning design hard would be if you've ever had to kind of explain to someone that you just met and who doesn't work in your field what you do, that's probably maybe a kind of glib answer of why it's hard. But I think on a, on a more of a serious note, I think everyone's kind of talked about um, a whole range of different things. I think one of the reasons why it's hard is it's kind of real a real sort of 360 type of job because you know, as Mal talked about um, knowledge of psychology and Luke talked about influencing people and managing people. And then Tom alluded to the fact that sometimes the conditions in an organization or a university aren't really there for you to, um, you know, express yourself is one way of putting it, I suppose, in, in the way that you'd like to or bring to bear your skills and what you want to do. So, you know, I think, um, but, uh, you know, being being more of a half, half uh, glass, half full kind of guy, I think the 360 aspect is a really great aspect of learning design because you, you you're... You're never quite there in all of those aspects, but you have the opportunity to learn and develop in all of those different ways. And, and at different stages in your career, maybe some of those things will be more important than others. Um, but, you know, that is simultaneously hard, but also fantastic as well to be able to learn all of those things and to be a, be in a job in which, you know, those, you, you know you, you're developing skills in all of those different areas. So that's that's yeah, that's my positive take on on the question, just following Ashmal's lead on that. Um, okay, then the next question. Uh, oh, shall we go to a, a Mentimeter question from the audience quickly? Um, I think next we were going to ask um, what, yeah, the question is actually uh, already in play, um, which is what do you think would be difficult about, difficult about changing sector as an LB? So I, I just want to like let any of the panelists answer that question. Um, you know, this happens sometimes. You know, you you're an LB and you're working in higher ed, and you're like, I uh, I don't I can't stand university people. I want to work in the uh, corporate sector and get that uh, L and D money, or you know, or they're just like no L and D or you know. Private sector is not for me. I want to, you know, work in an intellectually rich environment, bathe in the intellectual sunshine, or, or you know, or I want to work for an OPM. How how difficult is it for for people to to move from one uh, sector as a learning designer to another? I I can say something in uh, about my experience, and that is that I moved from. Um, pure higher education so that's working in undergrad and master's programs to now what i do is work in executive education <clears throat> and just for some context executive education sits usually as part of a business school within universities but it can be a separate limited company like gypsum is at the university of cambridge and for me that, that that's been a real eye-opener because we're not constrained uh, in some ways by uh regulations and assessments uh and we can get really creative and that with that creativity comes a lot of um responsibility but also um a lot of there, there could be a bit of anxiety because you have so much potential you have so much you could do um that you we essentially have an experience catalog and you get all these experiences so in a good way we have so much creativity and that's been such an eye-opener because we can do things that I never thought falls under that educational umbrella, whether that's integrating music, theater, art, um, media into our learning experiences. But on the other hand, uh, it could be a, a daunting prospect because you come, in, you come into a world that gives you so much power and with that comes uh, anxiety and responsibility. I might just dive in as well, which kind of maybe is building a little bit on my my last answer, which was that I guess if you if you move um, if you move sector, um, you might feel that 
you know, there's that kind of difficulty in that that sense of being uncomfortable in in one of those many areas that different panelists have talked about uh, uh, that that you have to kind of you have to develop skills in. And so, you know, in a in a particular context, you might have um, you know flexed the muscles in a particular area, and then you're moving to a different sector, and suddenly other things that perhaps you've um, you know neglected to focus on for you know for obvious reasons suddenly become more important and so you know again um i'm kind of um on the glass half full kind of uh kind of side of things but i think you know it may be that in particular areas of that kind of breadth of skill sets that you need as a learning designer you know that you're not quite there with that and that's uncomfortable because you're moving to an environment and a sector in which those the lack of those skills are more pronounced, but it gives you the opportunity to develop those skills as well. And I'll jump in real quick as well, agreed with what both of the panelists also just talked about. The other thing I would be adding to this and kind of like flipping this conversation a little bit more is not about the difficulty as far as for taking the skill set and then obviously moving it over into a different sector, which that is difficult. But what I would then actually say is then determining for you as a designer, where do you find the meaning in your work? Because I know a lot of people who have gone from one sector into another, and what they quickly realized is that things were different. They actually found a lot of meaning inside of their work, let's say from a higher education perspective, because what they were able to do was that they really wanted to focus on making learning experiences that were going to be incredible for students and learners. They valued the relationships of working with professors and instructors. They love being able to actually go and to coach somebody about how to make their offering better. And then they were monitoring the progress and the growth after every single term going through course evaluations, realizing we can improve upon the courses and then make them better every single time. So that feedback to them felt like they were making a difference inside of a higher education space, therefore inside of someone's world when they go out into the real world and they actually get a job. But then they go into a different sector for corporate, and now it's going to be more of the focus about thinking about the values of your employees and about these learners. And you're focusing on, let's say, workforce training and development and actually seeing in real time the return on investment from within the organization's perspective. And that is a different type of thing. It's a different type of way as far as for you to be able to think about what do you really value at the end of the day when you put your head on your pillow at night, you're like, yes, I actually did something that contributed to this organization. What does that look like? And People don't often think about that. Leonard, as you mentioned, for some people, they focus more about the salary and they focus more about the perks and the benefits, but then they realize in their actual day-to-day, -day, they're like, oh, I'm actually just using storyline way more than I ever thought, I guess this is okay. And then for other people, it's like, oh, I'm building inside of this learning platform all night and day. Sure, I guess this is all right. But there's many other different types of factors that you should be taking into consideration, not just from how much is it going to pay you, the pay and the benefits of vacation and, and blah, blah, blah. But also, where do you actually find the joy and what it is that you do as a designer? Because that by far is going to say, are you going to be happy with wherever you go next? I think just to just to build on what Luke said, I think sometimes making that move can help illuminate that for you as well, even though that that's that's difficult sometimes if you're potentially gone from one place to another place and you suddenly realize actually I enjoyed that last place um it, or, or that last sector um you know that that can I suppose maybe that speaks to actually the value of just different experiences in kind of illuminating what it is about learning design, which is a, a broad field and can, you know, can encompass lots of different types of, of, of work in different organizations, kind of helping to, to illuminate what it is that you really enjoy about that kind of thing and, and, and help you to find the sector and the organization where, um, you know, you're going to have, have opportunity to kind of go in that direction. I mean, I've only ever worked in corporate, so I'm somewhat limited on this view. Um, but the one thing I would say going from sector to sector within the corporate world is that it will remind you how important in what you do your basic communication skills are, um, which especially if you're in one sector for a long time, it happened to me, can perish at all because you have your shorthands, you have your go-to people, you don't have to adjust to different people communicating differently. Um, moving between sectors will force you to become better at dealing with people, um, which is an invaluable skill for your life as well as your career. And, okay, one last question. Um, and thank you for those responses. They're just amazing. I, they're kind of quite like, sort of mic drop 
level responses. Um, the, the last one is about what advice you would give to people who are having a hard time. They're in, they're in, the, they're in the field, they're, they're feeling stuck. I have a, a friend who's a very, very clever uh, learning designer uh, who I said, I, I saw them very bravely tweet uh, this um, on Twitter. And, and she said, uh, and I quote, I am seriously considering leaving e-learning. After 12 years of doing this, being qualified out of the eyeballs and still not being taken seriously or respected, it's hard for me to believe this is worth my time. Watching newcomers with zero experience trot into excellent wages and seniority has become too much to accept that this is a serious occupation and not some, uh, quote, your face fits, unquote, and your nonsense theories unrooted in research, practice, or in many cases, common sense. Obviously, this is a very unhappy, this person's not a happy person at, at the moment. And I, and I really respect her and, um, and admire her honesty, you know, to, to share this, because I don't know if, I, you know, I've, I've certainly felt that way before. Um, what, what, you know, what can you say to, to someone like that that's feeling, you know, stuck um, in, in l and I appreciate this is a difficult question, but um, anyone who wanted to jump in. <laughs> If I can go first, I would I would just say yeah, for sure. I would I have a lot of empathy with what she's saying there. Uh, it can feel hard sometimes, and I've had similar feelings in the past. But the key is to believe in, in yourself, but also to believe in in the field of learning design. Just prior to our session, I dropped into the uh, to the keynote, the afternoon keynote, and the speaker there was talking about how the learning design has become such an important aspect of not just designing courses and modules, but actually thinking about design thinking and learning design thinking as the redesigning the whole university, essentially. So I think having patience, uh, especially as we now enter a new era, I would say, of AI, gives us uh, more, more power. Uh, and more capabilities and those skills that she has learned and others have learned, they won't be to go to waste it. But there is a certain amount of uh, communication as, uh, um, as Luke mentioned as well, in terms of stakeholder management and promoting learning design and talking about learning design passionately and all, all the things that we love about learning design, talking about that passionately and selling that to people in, a, in, in quote marks. I think will make the difference. So I would say it, it is difficult and if it feels like it, you can get stuck, but with patience and perseverance and believing in yourself and keep upgrading your skills, the right opportunity will show up. And those are usually like leadership opportunities. And when you take them, then you bring all that emotion and all those uh, theories and all those knowledge, and then you can help others to, to rise up with you as well. If, if I might dive in as well, I mean, I think one of the pieces of advice just kind of answering the question directly is kind of to, to speak to other people because, you know, speaking to other learning designers will help you help in terms of sharing that burden and help give some perspective to maybe the struggle that you're facing. And that might be just how you might tackle it in terms of progressing as a learning designer and what you might do about that. But it also might actually just illuminate ways in which you might go in a different direction in your career and that's not to kind of um you know to kind of push 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 people out but you know we spend a lot of our time uh, in work and if we're not enjoying that then that's a challenge isn't it for us and for our families often so um you know but i think again on striking a more positive note you know if you're a learning designer and you've got great people skills project management skills or you have great knowledge of uh, learning theory you know that then you have um, you have a great and attractive skill set to look in, in other directions, and that direction might ultimately then lead you back into learning design. But um, I, I think you know, in, 
networking with others, speaking to other learning designers, I think would be a really good first step if you're if you're struggling, because I think that will help you sort of process that um, and uh, help you kind of figure out what you what you do from there. And just to jump onto that, that's sort of very similar. I, I definitely, when you when you read out the quote, I was like, yeah, I've, I've totally felt that. Um, my solution was start a podcast, a YouTube channel and a conference. Um, and I could lie and say that was about giving back to the, the rest of the learning world. It was not. It's about I want to speak to interesting people like me. Um, how can I do that without being the awkward person going? Do you want to be friends um, on the internet? Um, you invite them onto a podcast or you do something like that. Um, you kind of engineer scenarios to make you closer to people who share that passion. Um, because I would definitely agree that I think there is a, a challenge in our industry where there are people in the L&D space who are hyper passionate. You look around a room of people here voluntarily. So they're going, yes, I. the one thing I want to spend my time doing today is being here for this chat. Right. And then you've got people at the opposite end of the spectrum who are in L&D, perhaps because they're coasting to retirement or because they were great at their job. So they became a trainer kind of by accident, um, but then didn't embrace that. Um, and that's always going to be the case. And then we've got to remember that it's our it's the case in every industry. We're not a special case. If you speak to anyone, whether they're in sales, whether they're in people management, whether they're in ops management, whatever it might be the same thing exists. So we've kind of got to think about where do we draw our satisfaction from? Is it the job title and the salary or is it in what we choose to do? Um, and if it's in what we choose to do, then it doesn't have to be at work. It can be in the wider community. Um, it could be changing jobs. It could be, you know, going, I don't want to be a senior leader because senior leadership seem to spend all their time talking and not doing. So instead, I'm going to do something that is all practical. Um, and that's okay. You don't have to become a CLO to be successful in your L&D career. You don't have to be a head of to be successful. You get to define what your success looks like. Um, and there are plenty of us, myself included, that go, I would never want that job. I don't want to stop being on the ground. I want to be there. Um, so that's a, a really important decision to make as early as you can, but also review it as regularly as possible. Evan, I'll just, I'll piggyback off of Tom. And also that's how Tom and I became friends via podcast. So, you know, totally right about that. <laughs> Trying to meet people online. But the thing that I would add to all of this too, is that oftentimes what I hear about from people who say that they are feeling stuck, it's not just feeling stuck about their entire career, but it's more about they're actually being able to identify that they're feeling stuck within their organization because they feel trapped if they have to be there. They've been there for years. They've never imagined another life of moving on. They don't know what to do. So if that's the thing, first thing is first, I would say to identify, why are you actually feeling stuck? Is it like that's where you are feeling trapped within your organization and you can't imagine going elsewhere because that has all that you've actually known or is it Leonard as what you were talking about that you're feeling trapped as in you're not feeling respected and valued as a human being so therefore there's a much huge larger issue to be able to deal with that but coming about it from an organization's perspective what I want you to think about for folks listening right now that you are a living breathing walking brand you are your own individual and what I tell my students who I teach inside of an EDD program um, and applied learning sciences is that I will say do not identify with your organization identify with your skills and with your strengths because people will let you down your organization will let, will let you down but your strengths will never ever let you down all of your accomplishments your hard work your education your training everything that you have gone through for upskilling and all that other good stuff that resides within you and then that moves with you wherever you go whatever you decide to do so if it's going into a different organization a different sector or even a completely different type of field apart from the design, you are you. So focus on you as you are moving through with everything. And then that's what's going to guide you to your next chapter. That's amazing. Gosh. Um, <laughs> I love, I love all these responses and I've, I've really loved doing this because people like, um, like the four of you have given me such rich responses that I, I wasn't I didn't know the answers to these questions. I didn't know what to expect. And, and so um, it's really brilliant. And, and I'm so grateful to the four of you for, for coming along. Um, I, I think at this point, uh, those are the, the questions that uh, I have. Is if anyone, if we could, uh, from either uh, Mentimeter or from the audience, 
if, if anyone had any comments or, or questions to to share. Um, there you are. Oh, hi. Thanks for your contributions. Really inspiring to listen to you. Uh, I have a question uh, which um, uh, forgot, uh, in, with regards to the, a lot of comments which I have heard or I have said myself that we seem to be frustrated by the fact that our expertise in learning design or the science of learning is not recognized. And I was wanted to ask you how, um, when, I, when I see that, if this is a comment that's common to all of us, maybe we are not good at explaining what we do. So I'm trying to see what can I do to make my expertise more visible to a person that frankly doesn't know, not, doesn't even care what they to see, they just need to do something. So what would be your advice as for someone like me to communicate what I can offer in the room in a way that their person understands without having to know the science. Anyone want to jump in? If I may, yeah. Um I would say that probably the, the, the biggest mistake I think broadly, and you have to paint with broad broad brushes when making this statement, but I'll include myself in it. Um, early in my career. L D spends a lot of time selling itself on itself talking about us, our practices, why our processes, our approach is so fantastic, where in actual fact, we should be asking much simpler questions around what are your challenges? How can I help you? Um, and have that conversation instead. Um, it's a bit like, it's weirdly a bit like the sell me this pen interview question. Um, those who answer it well, don't sell the pen. They ask why they need the pen. Um, and that's what we should be doing rather than talking about the the science behind our approach and how our approach has worked in the past. Instead, we should be talking about the person we're talking to. Um, again, thinking about that servant mindset and that shift around, we're here to help. This is how I can help, but I can only have that conversation once I know what their problem is. Thank you. I, can I dive in as well and answer that? I think, um... I think maybe just to, to, to elaborate a bit more on, on Tom's answer, I think there is often the kind of power differential between um, a learning designer and maybe an academic in a university. And so I think, you know, to what Luke was saying earlier around developing that relationship and that trust. Um, but I think um, the, the, the point around the kind of, I guess, the science of learning is kind of your expertise and your knowledge. And I think the other dimension in terms of building trust and involving yourself maybe with academic is actually coming a bit their way in terms of understanding, you know, what, what they're teaching, you know, maybe something around the pedagogy around that particular subject as well as a means of um, building trust and having a dialogue around the things that um, uh, exemplify your approach and your thinking behind it. And um, I think that can, that can also be a useful, um, a useful way of, uh, starting that conversation or getting to that conversation. And I'll just jump in quickly as well too, not to, not to keep on going. You already got some great answers, but the, but the other thing that I like to be able to try to figure out too, is when working with different types of stakeholders, if we're inside of a kickoff call, whether virtually or in person, and we are going around the room, introducing ourselves and saying who we are, what it is that we do. When I am working with somebody, I like to actually ask, have you ever worked with a designer before? If yes, tell me more. And if no, I have a place to start. What I have often found is that now people are starting to know more about designers of who we are and what it is we do but there is a lot of misinformation out there and misconceptions that I realize that quickly I need to be able to clarify and to clean up because I have had it happen before where a SME will just send me over a 700 PowerPoint slide deck and they're like, here you go. Here's everything. You're good, right? I'm like, no, no, I'm not good. This will not be a good product at the end of the day. If you want me this to do this and I have no interaction with you, this is not going to be a fun time. So oftentimes I like to hear more about their perceptions of a designer and then to either build upon that and then to clarify. And then if it is possible and you have enough time to be able to do so, to then actually go through, explain about your role, and then also to demo as far as for a product or something that you have created to show them a visual of like, oh, wow, that's something that I can potentially see myself becoming a part of and putting my name on that product. And then now they have an end goal in sight, which for a lot of the time for my higher education world, that people are like, oh, it's a course. Everyone knows what a course 
course looks like. And it's like, well, minor difference. I really go through and talk about learning strategies. I really try to be able to say that whatever we're going to be accomplishing for our goals, that the students are indeed going to be able to do that by the end of the first week, the second week, the third week, and so on and so forth. And eventually, if you go through with everything, that person then becomes your champion. And then those people are going to talk to other people to then say that, oh yeah, I worked with Luke on that project. It came out really awesome. And then they actually sell it for me so that that way I do not need to go through. So I am spreading information in my own way. And it starts with that first person and really give them all the attention and time that I have. And I found that that has really helped me out within my higher education world. That's fantastic. And um, that's exactly what happened to me because uh, I did awesome work. And then people were all like, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, the, we've got one more question. Um, and then I think the, those of us face to face, maybe going to a pub and raising a toast to, to the four of you. Um, the last question is from uh, Michael Wright, who's uh, participating online, who says, where do you, this is, should be a fun one. Uh, where do you think learning design will be in 10 years and what can we do now to prepare? Uh, if I can, if I can answer for, for me, a big part of learning design is about finding patterns and recognizing connections, whether that's in content or trends, um, technology, or even the, 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 the people that I work with. Um, so I, I think it, it's, it's a level, it's a high level of thinking that that's helped me, uh, to, to find connections and uh, and bring people and things together in different ways. And I use technology to the benefit of that uh, goal as well. So um, I think with the pace that the tech is moving forward, there is a feeling that a lot of jobs will become uh, redundant and not useful. But I think learning design actually is one of the roles that will stay strong because it, it's, it's a, th a level of thinking that that I don't think computers can do at the moment or in the next five to 10 years. So uh, make connect, continue to look for connections, look for trends and um, bring things together in a human way as much as possible and the rest should be okay. Um, I just add to that and say, um, you know, the the research and the understanding of kind of how we learn is just kind of growing. I think that knowledge is always going to be useful and valuable, um, whatever learning design looks like in 10 years time. So uh, I think um, an investment in uh, that knowledge and deepening that knowledge and keeping abreast of developments, I think will serve, um, will serve us all well, really, in learning design. I'd like to think, if I'm honest, that technology becomes less and less of a cornerstone of the conversation, where at the moment we're at that kind of awkward stage, I kind of feel with technology, where it works like a solid 80% of the time, but then 20% of the time it just gets in the way. And I'd like to think in a decade, maybe that 20% will reduce a little bit and we can spend more time talking about the human process of learning and what our people need and the conversations we need to have and less about and which platform is going to be quite right for delivering that because it will just work um i think my hope anyway i'm probably wrong i'll see you in 10 years i guess <laughs> Yes, when we answer to our robot overlords, it's going to be a great time. Uh, yeah, definitely. I want to make sure to mention everything that a fellow panelist just said for sure. Paying attention to AI, paying attention to everything else is coming out is definitely going to be very helpful. You should know about it. You do not need to be an expert, but you should definitely have a sense about it. I was reading about how there's a bunch of YouTube content creators right now, and they are hiring for prompt engineers. That is the title they are using because they realize the value of different types of um, AI and language models, but they need to be able to have somebody who knows how to get the best out of it. So that's the current job that they are hiring for, like literally right now. I just read that last week, which is extremely 
extremely interesting. But then going back into our own design world, yes, knowing about the tools and the tech, like Tom, I hope that is not going to be prevalent. Is that going to be more about being in the background for how we automate things? I also really hope too that for AI, it's going to be giving a much needed boost to accessibility and to many other different types of things pertaining to online learning that it should be designed for everybody. And there's a lot of people out there who struggle to take into consideration all backgrounds, all experiences and everything else of the sort. So if we do have AI that can help us with more about thinking like of a universal design for learning perspective and making sure that indeed everyone is finding the learning experience to be meaningful, engaging and relevant, that's where I really, really, really hope that our field goes in our direction pertaining to uh, technology. Can't top that. Um, so I think probably we should we should end here. Um, Neil, Tom, Ajmal, Luke, thank you very very much. Um, and and getting the right yeah, and thank, and thank you. Um, and, and also thank you to to Leo and, and Nicola, our uh, SIG uh, conveners, uh, SIG leaders. Um, uh, yes, we will be, um, I think, uh, progressing to the, to the pub now and, and raising a toast to you. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, folks. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone. Thank bye, bye Just wanted to say thanks for participating in the Mentimeter. Sorry that we didn't really get to pick up on a lot of your comments um, due to our technical issues at the beginning, yeah. um, but I have shared the link on Twitter in case you want to um, look at the um, sort of final um, res responses um, and see what each other had to say as well. And um, thanks everyone, it's been, been good fun.